continue our introduction to metamorphic rocks. And we're going to do that by reviewing a little bit of what we did last class. We were under B, under Roman numeral 1, and we we're talking about facies and protoliths. And I want to organize all those now underneath an idea called metamorphic grade. Metamorphic grade is actually a very simple concept. It can be anything from high to low, and it really reflects the amount of change a rock has gone under. Amount of change. That's an N, not, a, not an R. So there can be rocks that have had very low amounts of change, or rocks that are middle, and, and of course there's rocks that have gone high amount of change and have high metamorphic grade. As we go back to facies, we would put rocks like eclogite under a high metamorphic grade. Also, granulites. These are high metamorphic grades. Granulite. Maybe blue schist would be another high metamorphic grade. Under middle, these are things like amphibolites and green schists. And the low, well, zeolites, and also the fun one, right? Prenite, pompeliite. As we put all of these faces in context, we had that graph, right? And that graph had an X and a Y axis. You might want to draw, pause and draw that again right here with the Y axis of pressure and the X axis of temperature. And once you have all the bubbles in, like prenite, pompeliite, and green schist, there was an area here that said not possible. And what we want to do is, as we redraw this is put in lines to think about how temperature and pressure changes in the earth. And what I wanted to do was add three lines to this. One was going to be our line for 25 degrees C per kilometer. Our normal kind of middle of the continent geotherm. And that line goes through about like so through our diagram. It hits a lot of the big facies. But that's not the only possibility. We could have a situation in a very magmatically active area where there's a lot of contact metamorphism where the pressures stay really low but the temperatures get really hot fast. And so we could put an actual another geotherm that's possible tectonically like this. Maybe it's something like 40 to 50 degrees C per kilometer. This would be the realm of contact metamorphism or some area that's very magmatically active. Magmatically active. Now we also need to have an environment that can hit our blue schist domain, right? A blue schist hangs out out here. How do we hit that pathway? Well, we have to undergo a PT path, that's what we call these things, that it ends up being very cold. So for any given pressure, it's actually a very low temperature. This could be something like 10 degrees C per kilometer. And it's along these kind of pathways that subduction zones will take you. And the reason why is you have a subducting slab that is essentially acting like an ice cube that cools the mantle and the crust in that area, keeping things colder than where it should be. So the next thing I wanted to do was draw kind of a tectonic schematic to put all of the facies in, in line. And so what we need to do, oh boy, this is going to be hard with my, with my tablet, but what we need to do is draw like a, let's draw a sutured mountain range. Here's our sutured mountain range. And it's producing a keel that goes down. There's the base of the moho. And we have two plates that have slammed into one another like the Himalaya. Then let's see this shed away from the mountains. Let's go to a basin. And then the basin's going to go, there's going to be a, another mountain range here with a subsequent keel. And this one has been produced by subduction because we're going to have a subducting slab come down like so. Hey, that turned out pretty nice. There's our plate tectonic environments. And so now what we can do is we're going to superimpose faces on these different environments. So let's see, I'll go grab, I'll, I'll do this in red. And you can try to guess maybe where things would be. But like something like eclogite is going to occur here and here in these very high temperature, high pressure, deep environments. Blue schists will only occur here a place where the plate keeps everything cool as the subduction is bringing material down, but pressures are still really high in this convergent boundary. Green schists, let me go back to red just so it's easier to see. 
Green schists form in shallow subduction zones, prehnite pumpelliite here at the shallowest bit, and then maybe out here where it's just you're getting buried by pelagic sediment, you could get zeolites. We could do the same thing in this mountain range. We could have prehnite pumpelliite, and then green schist, and then maybe we just reach amphibolite facies there. In a true mountain range, we're going to have the full sequence. Zeolite, prehnite pumpelliite, green schist, amphibolite, granulite, and then eventually echolite, all being controlled by the geotherm. And then what if we had just, uh, here's sediments being shed, we're going to create a sedimentary basin here, and even in that sedimentary basin, we could have zeolites forming and then prehnite pumpelliite. This is how I want you to visualize the metamorphic, to, um, the metamorphic facies with respect to plate tectonics. Now, moving away from our drawings, we can take some notes today as well. And this is going to be Roman numeral 3. And Roman numeral 3 is m methods. Okay, these are going to be the methods of metamorphic recrystallization. So let's just call this metamorphic crystallization. And here we're going to explore we're going to explore how rocks in a solid state can change minerals. There's going to be three different ways here, three ways, and they all work together. Okay? It's not like one is operating in some environments. No. They're just all working together at all times to allow this solid state change to occur. The first type of metamorphic crystallization is called recrystallization. Recrystallization. And with recrystallization, we're taking minerals that are already present in the protolith, and we are changing their size and their shape. Let's just draw this first. Let's say you take a sandstone. You could take a limestone too, that would be fine. In the sandstone, we've got all these quartz grains, and we metamorphose them, and we change their size and their shape. We make them more blocky now, but they're still all quartz. So we haven't changed the type of mineral. All right, we've just changed the size and the shape. That's recrystallization. So let's put this in. So minerals are already present in protolith. Protolith. They change shape and size. Our examples are going to be here. Sandstones and limestones going to quartzite or marble. So sandstone, that's going to go to a quartzite. Limestone, that will go to a marble. Those things are operating by recrystallization. You can have a bunch of interesting textures formed by recrystallization. Probably the most important of them is called a relict texture. What if you have a fossil in a limestone, you metamorphose the rock, but you can still see the fossil in the marble? Well, that's a relict fossil, and it would be an example of a relict texture. So we're going to put here that a said structure remains preserved. This is most common in sandstones and conglomerates where something like crossbedding gets preserved. So we can actually see a metamorphic rock that still preserves some kind of cross bedding. All right, second type of crystallization process that goes on is called polymorphism. We'll just call this polymorphs. A polymorph is where the composition is the same, but the lattice rearranges. We have a lot of different examples of this, maybe alpha beta quartz is something that you've learned about. But here we're going to go, okay, the crystal lattice rearranges but composition rearranges but composition stays the same. I bet every petrology class in the world uses this example when they're talking about metamorphism and polymorphs. If we were to put a pressure temperature diagram up and I talk to you about a mineral that is a formula of Al2Si O5, the aluminosilicate polymorphs. There's three minerals that occur um, with this chemical formula in metamorphic rocks. One is called andalusite. Another is called kyanite, beautiful blue-bladed kyanite. And then finally there is sillimanite, 
They are all L2SO5, but they occur in different regimes, pressure, temperature, space. If we put in the phase boundary stability zones, then the high pressure version is called kyanite. The low pressure version is called andalusite. And the high temperature version is called sillimanite. They're all the same lattice, but they have different structural arrangements in response to pressure. So that's going to be another one that occurs. And then finally, the last type of crystallization that goes on is called metamorphic reactions. Metamorphic reactions. And what this is, these are the growth of new minerals different than what was in the protolith. This is the slow process, the real solid state diffusion based process. So we're going to say here, we're going to go slow, diffusion controlled, and then what we're going to, we need to say that these are the growth of new minerals different than protolith. This is ongoing in metamorphic rocks all the time. The one way to picture this, let's draw an example here where we have a series of garnet crystals and they're growing by metamorphic reactions. Beautiful dodecahedrons here we're seeing in a thin section view or in hand sample. Ooh, that's not a beautiful dodecahedron. Should we erase that and put a new one in? Yeah, let's erase that. I've drawn them different sizes because they're growing at slightly different rates. And what we know about these is that these are iron and aluminum and silica garnets. And so iron and aluminum and silica are trying to find their way to crystallize to form these garnets. And they're diffusing in from the surrounding region. So we're going to put these arrows showing diffusion of elements like here's aluminum, there's silicon, here's some iron, here's some aluminum, here's some silicon, and they're all just diffusing in to grow these crystals. And then what each one does is it kind of soaks up all the good stuff from a region around itself. And so what we're creating here are these depleted halos where everything good has been soaked up for that mineral. So these are depleted halos. This is how I want you to picture metamorphic reactions occurring. All right, and so all three of these metamorphic reactions and polymorphism and recrystallization, they're always ongoing in every metamorphic rock to create the textures that we see. Now to finish up this lecture, I'd like to go into Roman numeral four, which is gonna be a series of drawings to introduce to you the three, uh, four main types of crystal textures that we see in metamorphic rock. Crystal textures. There's four here, we're just gonna, whoa, what happened there? We gotta zoom back in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Sorry about that. The crystal textures. We have number one is gonna be called granoblastic texture. Number two, porphyroblastic. Porphyroblastic texture. Then we're gonna have, texture number three is a foliated texture, foliation, and then four is lineation. Once we get these defined, lecture is done for the day. So for granoblastic, what do we have? We've got crystals that are largely polygonal and equal sized. This is what happens in a marble and in a quartzite where we draw, this is how we can draw it, we're going to draw a bunch of hexagons and pentagons and squares. They're all about the same size. They're all polygons, and they're all interlocking. That is a granoblastic texture that is going to fill a rock. It's the easiest one to forget about. It kind of produces like a matrix that's easy to ignore. But this is a texture that we see in a lot of rocks. Now, porphyroblastic is the one that we don't ignore. These are the outsized crystals outsized crystals. These are the ones that the treasure hunters want to go and find. They are oftentimes, and we'll just say it this way, generally euhedral. So if we had a rock, here's our rock, we could have a big beautiful garnet crystal sitting in that rock. 
so big and beautiful. That is called, that is our porphyroblast. Now, if we had a porphyroblast, let me draw another porphyroblast. A porphyroblast, here's our big porphyroblast, and inside it there was a bunch of inclusions. Well, that's a special type of porphyroblast called a poikiloblast. All right, so then our last two textures, foliation. This is the alignment of platy minerals. All right, things that are sheet-like, like the micas, when they are aligned by pressure, it's called foliation. And alineation is when you have high aspect ratio. This is the alignment of high aspect ratio crystals. Oops, I forgot the word alignment. Align Mint of high aspect ratio crystals, things like rods and needles. To draw a, let's draw each one of these. Well, for this, we're going to draw a bunch of, I guess, what are these? Columnar crystals. And they're all going to point in the same direction. That's something that we see in lineated elongate minerals, is that they tend to be all aligned in a similar direction. That's called a lineation. And foliated minerals, they also tend to be aligned in response to pressure. And so what we can do to draw this, let's see, we're going to draw a sheet, like a sheet of paper. And then we need to draw a bunch more of these sheets of paper. They're all kind of stacked up on top of each other. Right, I'm trying to make them look 3D here. That's working. All right, so there's our sheets of paper, and they align to pressure like this. So what we can say is that that foliation and lineation, these are indicators of deformation. Indicators of deformation. And we're going to get into deformation more in the next couple mini lectures. All right, see you then.